All right, everybody, make yourself comfortable and grab your Bible and open it to Psalm 139. Psalms is the biggest book in your Bible. It's right in the middle of the Old Testament. It's part of the poetic literature of the Old Testament. It begins with Job, then Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. There are five poetic books in the Old Testament, and we're going to examine Psalm 139. Now, for the last two years... Well, if you've talked to somebody about getting it, uh, it's very likely that you were referring to COVID-19. Uh, did you get it? Have you gotten it yet? Uh, but today I want to talk about getting it in a totally different way, okay? Because in 2021, there were many, many, many people at this church who finally got it. You know, if you're a parent and you've been trying to get your kids to get it, to see it, They've been doing it the wrong way for so long, but finally something clicks, the light dawns, and they get it. You feel good about your parenting, don't you? You feel good. You feel successful. You feel like you're contributing to the well-being of your children. It is very, very exciting to me personally as I look over the last year in our church to see how many people got it. I mean, it clicked. They'd been going at it the wrong way. They just didn't have enough information, or maybe their pride got in the way. Something changed, however, and now they get it. The beautiful thing about it, when we get it, is our lives begin to change. Now, for some people, that change is dramatic. It's almost instantaneous. Like, they get it, and bam, they respond, and bam, their life changes dramatically. But that's kind of rare. For most of us, our lives begin changing slowly once we get it. One thing I know for sure of all the people who got it at this church in 2021, not one of them regrets getting it. Now, when I use the term getting it, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about surrender. When this book describes an appropriate response to God in light of Jesus Christ, it means surrender. Getting it means surrender. Spiritually speaking, it's about trust. It's about faith. It's about security. Maybe you're close to getting it. Maybe you're closer than you've ever been before. And this is the time of the year when you start turning things over in your mind. You start reflecting. You know, I don't know what it is about, you know, turning the page of a calendar. It's intuitive. It's part of our self-conscious. I'm not sure what it amounts to, but there's no time of self-reflection like this time. Many of you for the last several days, if not weeks, have been pondering the path of 2021 and looking forward to the path of 2022. Now, I got to be honest with you. I think almost any kind of year in 2022 is going to be better than the last two we've endured, right? I'm looking forward to something new, something bigger, something better, something fresh. But there's something about the changing of the calendar year. It's like snow fell overnight. It's like our path, as far as we can see to the horizon, is freshly new fallen snow. There's not one footprint in it, and so we start to ponder. We think about goals. We think about hopes. We think about dreams. It's why we make resolutions to lose weight, to eat right, to exercise, to get more involved in church, to engage in a quiet time with God. Maybe that's something you've never done before, to give more consistently to the church. It's because intuitively we know that the new year is rife with potential and opportunity. Well, if you're looking for something new in 2022, I just want to humbly remind you that there are far more important things than a slimmer figure or a more aggressive mutual fund or a little more money stashed away for a rainy day, or a better diet. Again, it's the time of year more than any other that we reflect. And now, I don't want to mislead you. I'm not a resolution guy. I don't sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and write out number one, number two, number three. But I do reflect. I ponder. I, I consider. I think. I pray. I examine my life. I look backward, and then I look forward it's part of the new year resolution. That's the word we make. 
or we use? Resolution. We resolve ourselves that things are going to be different next year. Things are going to be better next year. I find that New Year's resolutions typically fall into one of three categories. Every time we make a New Year's resolution or consider the coming year and some of the changes we want to make, they generally fall in one of these three categories. Either they are related, number one, to our happiness. I resolve myself to do this because I believe it's going to make me happy in 2022. That's why we go on diets and that's why we hit the gym. We think to ourselves, if I feel better about myself, I'm going to be happier in 2022 than I was in 2021. That's why we decide to put more money away for retirement. That's why we decide to to spend more time with family and friends. If we can reach our goal in 2022, then we're going to be happier than we were in 2021. Happiness. But there's another category. It has to do with time. Time. Many of our New Year's resolutions are related to time. More time. A better use of our time. More meaningful time. Less wasted time. When you make a resolution, you're basically establishing a priority. And priorities are always related to time. And then there's a third. Significance. When we make New Year's resolutions, often it is to feel better about ourselves. Who wouldn't want to feel more significant? What can I do? What goal can I achieve? What might I accomplish that would cause me to feel better about myself? So here's what I'm going to do. Over the next couple of weeks, I just want to examine those three categories. Happiness, time, and significance. What does the Bible say? about happiness. Is happiness, our happiness, as important to God as it seems to be to us? What what does the Bible say about how we use our time? How we should view our time? Whose time is it really? And what about matters of significance? Now, many, many years ago, and many of you men will remember this, men used to carry on wallets that were this thick. Some of you still do, but it's not for the reason I'm about to describe. My wallet never had that much money in it, maybe a couple of credit cards or a gas card, but the reason my wallet was so thick is because of that accordion fold picture thing that would fall out, right? Here's my wife, look, here's my wife, look, here's my kids, look, here's my grandkids, here's that big deer that I shot last hunting season, all right? Today we don't do that. Today we carry around our pictures in our cell phones, right? By the way, if you'll excuse me from being a little bossy, people... Organize the photographs in your cell phone. Somebody ever pull you aside, you meet them at Ace Hardware or in the grocery store. Oh, oh, let me show you a picture and here's how it goes. Hang on. Here, hang on. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, no, no, no. How much time you have? Hang on. We carry around all of our photographs. They represent our life and our experiences in that cell phone. Well, hear me. All of us, every one of us, is carrying around another very important image with us, but it's not in our cell phone. It's been with us since we were little children. It has everything to do with our happiness. It has been developing and changing over time. And believe me, it's closely related to the feelings of significance that we have or have been seeking. What is that picture, you ask? It's our self image. It's our self-image. Since we were little children, we've been developing that picture. And it's a picture of you, not someone else. And it's a picture of how you see you, not how someone else sees you. That's why it's called a self-image. Psychologists tell us that there are basically three questions that we seek to answer throughout our lives that help us build and develop our self-image. The first person I ever read that kind of laid this out for me was Dr. James Dobson many years ago with Focus on the Family. Dr. Dobson said, the first question we ask is, how do I look? How do I look? And the answers we receive throughout our lifetime to that one question, how do I look, determines our self-image. Now, if I may sound a little bit presumptuous, ladies, I don't mean to sound sexist. I honestly don't. It's not my intention. But this is a very important question for women, or at least it seems to be. 
If you're a man and you've been married longer than 15 minutes, you've heard that question three times. Honey, how do I look? Honey, how does this look? I've been married 30 years. I believe it's a daily thing in our house. Honey, how do I look? How does this look on me? All right. Men, not so much. Men, we think we look good all the time, don't we? Looking good, right? Men think they look good no matter what, but not our wives, not our girlfriends. How do I look? Dr. James Dobson wrote, the most highly valued personal attribute in our society, especially popular culture, is physical attractiveness. You ever notice there's not an ugly newswoman on television, right? They might know zero about journalism, but if they're pretty, we're going to find a way to put them in front of a camera. That's why every person who tries to sell you something on television this afternoon is beautiful. They're beautiful. That's why when you sit down to watch a Hallmark movie with your wife, as I have done more times than I care to admit, everyone on that movie or in that movie is pretty. That's because in our culture, physical attractiveness is huge. We grow up believing that if our appearance is picture perfect, then I'll feel better about myself. And if I feel better about myself, I will be happy. Sadly, however, by the time we're adults, if we're not happy with how we look, with our physical appearance, the positive opinions of other people will have little to no effect on us. That's because we refuse to hear them. We've already developed our self-image. That's question number one. Here's question number two. How do I do? How do I do? Now, ladies, this is primarily a man thing. Men are all about performance appreciation, right? Men will literally search for a cheerleader to pat them on the back. You did a good job. You're so big and strong. Men are wired to crave recognition. Cheer for me. Tell me I did a good job. Now again, it's not solely male or solely female. It is, however, predominantly male. That's why workaholic men outnumber workaholic women in America three to one. Three to one. For every one woman in America who works more than 50 hours a week, there are two men who are willing to do it. Why? Because men are craving recognition. I know some people who feel best about themselves when they're absolutely to the point of physical exhaustion because they work hard and they work long hours and then they sleep. And they get up and do it again. They work hard and they work long and then they sleep. They're caught in the cycle of someone who's searching for performance appreciation. Here's number three. How important am I? How important am I? Children are all about this question. Mom, dad, how important am I? You see, all of us formulated a mental image of ourselves based upon the feelings of acceptance that we received from our parents growing up. And one of the best ways to determine our acceptance or how important we are is to measure the amount of time that mom and dad wanted to spend with us. Moms and dads, you need to understand that even if your kids don't come out and say it verbatim, they're asking you a question every day in your home. How important am I? Dad, am I more important than your supervisor? Mom, am I more important than how clean your house remains? Dad, am I more important than your television show? Am I more important than your recreation? Mom, am I more important than your friends? How do I look related to happiness? If I look a certain way, I'll feel better about myself and surely I'll be happy. How do I do related to your time? If I better used my time, if I accomplished more... Could I gain the recognition I'm craving? And how important am I? Significance. Now, remember, before we keep going, get a little further, getting it means surrender, okay? Getting it means surrender. I want to try and tie all of this together by the time I finish. How many of us are going to begin 2022 the same way we close 2021? By trying to answer those same tired old questions. How do I look? 
Well, that's why I got to lose weight. That's why I got to hit the gym. I got to buy a new wardrobe, maybe a new car. I'm going to change my lifestyle. How do I do? I'm looking to get noticed. I'm seeking recognition. If I could just accomplish this or that, I got to keep up with the Joneses. And how important am I? I need to feel significant. Now, here's the big idea. I want to begin here, and then I want to try and prove it to you using Psalm 139. The only life that can deliver a happy new year for you or anyone else is the surrendered life, because the surrendered life is the blessed life. The only way in 2022, the only life in 2022 that can truly deliver a happy new year is the surrendered life, because the surrendered life is the blessed life. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to encourage you to surrender your happiness, to surrender your time, to surrender your craving for significance. You see, the Bible makes it plain to anybody who wants to read it that God has several ongoing projects in the life of every one of his followers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, God didn't just say, oh, great, you made a decision for my son. I'm going to write your name down here. Good. I'll see you later when we all go to heaven. That's not the way it works. According to this book, when you embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ, that's a decision you make. And when you make that decision, it doesn't end there. You made the decision in Christ. Now your faith walk continues in Christ. God begins to transform you into the image and the likeness of your son. Remember earlier I said, several of you who got it in 2021, God began to change you. It's a slowly developing process. That process is called sanctification. Sanctification. Now, I've told you this before. I throw words like this in every now and then in a sermon just to let everybody know I did go to school. Sanctification is God's work in the life of a Christ follower according to the New Testament. Listen to Philippians 2 and verse 12. Paul wrote, continue to work out your salvation. Hang on, hang on. I thought it was by God's grace we're saved. It is. Paul's not talking about earning holiness or righteousness before God. No, he's saying work out your salvation, Eugene Peterson translated in the message, that same phrase, be energetic in your life of salvation. Paul goes on, with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. What is God's good purpose in the life of a believer? Sanctification. That's what Paul is talking about. The process whereby you've responded to the grace of God, demonstrated through Christ. Now God, your Father, wants you to look like Jesus Christ. John 17, verse 16, Jesus prayed for his followers. Not just his followers then, but all of his followers that would come. Here's what he prayed. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, for your word is truth. When Jesus, the Son of God, prayed for you, one of his followers, this was his request. One more verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament teaches that sanctification is the process, the work, the project of salvation. You see, following your decision to embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ and become a follower, I believe Christ was who he claimed to be. I accept Christ as my Lord, my King, my boss. Following that decision, there's an action from God. He justifies you. You know what the term justify means? If, if I wrong you somehow... I lie to you, I take something from you, I, I abuse you in some way, and then I try to justify it. What am I doing? I'm trying to make it sound legit. I'm trying to make it straight. It was all crooked because I lied, I was selfish, I kept something from you, I abused your time or our friendship. It was all crooked, but when I justify it, I try and make it sound straight. 
when I justify the margins in the papers I write, what am I doing? I'm making them straight. That's what God did for me when I embraced his son, Jesus Christ, by faith. I responded to the grace of God by claiming Christ is my savior. He's the boss in my life. I will follow Jesus because he indeed was who he claimed to be. At that moment, the Bible teaches, God made me straight. The biblical word is righteous. He made me righteous. What follows is the work then of sanctification. And here's the beauty of it. You can either resist that work, push back at every turn, and only create more problems for yourself, or you can surrender. You can surrender to it. According to David in Psalm 139, I want to show you why Surrender is the logical response. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 139. Remember, David wrote this. The king writes, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Now, I want you to notice in the next few verses how often David repeats that idea, even that word. The first six verses are all about God's knowledge You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. Here it comes again. You know when I sit and when I rise. Even the most insignificant part of my life, how many times I stand up during the day, how many times I sit down during the day, when I'm in the bathroom, when I'm in the backyard, when I'm on the lawnmower, when I'm at work, God knows it all. He goes on. You perceive, there's another knowledge word, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern, there's another knowing word, my going out and my lying down. You are familiar, another knowledge word, with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in and behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. David wants you to understand surrender to God is your best option because, number one, God is omniscient. Omniscient means God knows everything. This has to do with knowledge. There are no facts out there that God doesn't already know. There is nothing to be known that God doesn't already know, but also it has to do with awareness. God is totally aware of everything that's going on around you. Totally aware of what's happening in our world. The logical response, according to David to God's omniscience, is surrender. You might as well surrender because he knows you inside and out. David says, God knows everything that can be known about you. There is nothing about you that God doesn't know. God knows what you're capable of. God knows what you just can't quite pull off. God knows how you're wired on the inside. Even what we consider to be insignificant, God knows it. He's aware of who we are. He's aware of what we're not. He created us to be some things, but he created us not to be other things. David understands that it is impossible to escape the omniscience, the all-knowing nature of God, because nothing can be hidden from God. My actions cannot be hidden. My motivations, my intentions, my thoughts, nothing can be hidden. David is in no position to oppose God's omniscience. So David's advice is go ahead and surrender. Keep reading. Look at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Now notice, we've shifted from what God knows to where God is. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you're there. See, we're talking about location, space, presence. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there as well. Look at verse 9. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, I wake up in the morning as the sun comes up. And then all throughout my day, eventually I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there, your hand will guide me. That emphasizes the fact that from the moment my feet hit the floor in the morning... Until I fall asleep that night, God has been with me through every step of my day, no matter where I go. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. 
The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. David says in the first six verses, you might as well surrender to God because he knows everything anyway. And in the next six verses, verses 7 to 12, you might as well surrender to God in 2022 because God's going to be with you through every step of the journey. And notice by the text that to the surrendered, the omnipresence of God, which is really what we're talking about, the fact that God is everywhere at one time, is a blessing. It's a blessing. In fact, God's omnipresence means God is everywhere at the same time. If you'll notice verse number, let me find it. 10, even there, regardless of where I am, even there, verse 10, your hand will guide me. You see, if you're surrendered, God's omnipresence is a blessing because he's guiding you. He's with you to guide you. And even there, your right hand will hold me fast. That's security. That's comfort. Interesting. God's omniscience and God's omnipresence. David understands that it's foolish to hide from God because it's impossible. You know, when I was a little kid, you play hide and seek when you're six or seven. I was a really good hider. You know, if I played with my six and seven year old peers, they never found me. And that's not an exaggeration because I could really hide. We had a big old barn on our property when I was growing up. And without opening the big sliding door on the front, there was a piece of tin that was loose in the back, and you used to pull that tin out, and you could slide in the barn. So the seeker never saw you go in there. And when I'd get in there, I wouldn't just hide behind the tractor parts or the old tires or the junk that was in that barn. No, I'd shimmy up the wall, and I'd get in the rafters. And I'd sit up in the rafters. And one seeker after another would pull open that barn door and they'd walk in and they'd look in all the obvious places, but they'd never look up. And I was right there on top of them until I'd play with my dad. My dad always found me. I couldn't hide anywhere without my father finding me. Do you know what a clean out box is on a fireplace? A clean-out box keeps you from shoveling all the ash on the inside of your house. No, you push it down this hole. Then you go outside so you won't make a mess on the inside. And you open up this little door. It can't be 12 inches. I used to open that clean-out door and shimmy in among those ashes and hide. That's how good a hider I was. My dad would still find me. David says, your best option is to surrender because you can't hide from God. You can't hide in 2022 from God. He is omnipresent. Now, one last word of advice. Start in verse 13. For you created my inmost being, God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now the shift is on who we are on the inside. That's what makes us significant. See, on the outside, I can be faulty. I can be failure prone. But my intention on the inside, that's what makes me significant before God. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, again, that's on the inside, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth... Notice verse 16, a powerful pro-life passage. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. Look at verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. David in this passage is pondering the magnitude, the power of God. It's a great way to begin your prayers, by the way. One of my staff members, when she opens up her prayer, she always ponders the awesome nature of God. Last verse, verse 18. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. The third reason, according to David, that your best option in 2022 is to surrender. That's the best path to a happy new year is God's omnipotence. The fact that God can do anything. Verse 13, you created my inmost being. You wove me together in my mother's womb. That means your personality strengths, your weaknesses. 
They're the result of God's omniscience and his omnipotence, his sovereignty and his power. Verse 16, again, all the days ordained for me were written down before even one of them came to be. David understood that this all-knowing, everywhere at once, all-powerful God had miraculously planned out his life. So in light of God's omniscience and his omnipresence and his omnipotence, the logical response seems to be surrender. Look how he ends the chapter, verse 23. David writes, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, And know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Why would David ask God to do that? God hadn't missed anything. David's not trying to remind God to take a second look. David's already proven to us that God knows everything. He's with us everywhere we go at all times. And he is all powerful. So why does David say, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Search me, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. That's a statement of surrender. That's what it is. David's not asking God to do something God hadn't already done. David is surrendering to the Father. Okay, go ahead, search me. Search me, go ahead. Test me. Go ahead. In light of your omniscience, in light of your omnipresence, in light of your omnipotence, I surrender. In light of Psalm 139, Have you ever made a statement of surrender to God? In light of David's words, how could you not? In 1968, three astronauts aboard the tiny capsule of Apollo 8, they circled the dark side of the moon and they headed for home. Suddenly over the horizon of the moon rose the blue and white earth surrounded by the glistening of the The light of the sun against that black void of space. This was the first time this had ever been captured on worldwide television. The audio captured for billions to hear. And these three men were learned men of science. Courageous men. Men of technology. Men of knowledge. Men of science. But at that moment when they saw that sight and it was so inspiring, they didn't utter Einstein's name. They didn't pull out their science textbook and begin reading from it. Only one thing could capture that awe-inspiring moment, that thrill of this magnificent observation. And billions worldwide heard the voice from outer space as he turned from his Bible and read, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God. The only way to describe that unspeakable awe, unutterable in any other way, was in the beginning, God. Ladies and gentlemen, the key to your new year is not a trimmer figure. It's not a more aggressive mutual fund. The key to your new year is surrender. The question is, will you trust the eternal God and his sovereign attributes with your 2022? Or will you continue to ask those same old tired questions? Hey, how do I look? How do I do? How important am I? If you've never prayed a prayer of surrender, I'm going to pray one now as we dismiss. This afternoon, find a quiet place and pray it yourself. Father, I am a stubborn man. Father, I generally think I'm right. Even when compared to your vast knowledge, your sovereignty, I have a strong will. Father, I surrender. I know better than to think that I'm in charge in 2022. I know better than to think that I have the answers. Father, in light of your knowledge, your omniscience, your your omnipresence, and your, your power, your omnipotence, I surrender. I want to be led through 2022, Father. I want to respond through 2022. 
I want to follow through 2022. I pray it because of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose image you are shaping me. And I pray it because of him. Amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. Go make it a fantastic week. I will see you next time.